Welcome to the Community Lecture Series. Today we are going to be talking about raising a child with cystic fibrosis. Uh, my name is Rayanne Craigenbring. I'm a prenatal genetic counselor at Sanford Maternal Fetal Medicine. And my name is Angie Hausvik. I am a nurse here at Sanford, but also am a mother with a child with cystic fibrosis. So many of you may have done some reading or know someone with cystic fibrosis, um, but the first clear reference to the disease comes from the old European folklore that woe to that child who when kissed on the forehead tastes salty. Um, and that really helped define how cystic fibrosis was diagnosed and the understanding that at that time, a child that had salty sweat did not have long to live. It wasn't until 1930s in New York City when uh, Dorothy Anderson, who was a pathologist, actually first described cystic fibrosis as impacting the pancreas or fibrosing of the pancreas. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the broader definition of cystic fibrosis and how that affects not just the pancreas but other organs um, in a little bit here. But even at that time, um, it was very clear that cystic fibrosis was inherited due to the combination of both uh, parental genes. And this was based on the observation that they could see multiple individuals in the same family that were affected. What is CF or what does this look like? So cystic fibrosis affects many organ systems, as you can see here. Um, the main, I guess, problem with cystic fibrosis has to do with mucus. So most of us have a thin, slippery mucus that lines all of our organs, our GI tract, our respiratory system, and so forth. Individuals with cystic fibrosis have a genetic change that causes that mucus to be thickened. Um, so it's really that thick mucus that can become problematic. So for example, one of the main organs we think about is the lungs. So individuals with CF or cystic fibrosis often have thick, sticky mucus that lines their lungs, which um, can cause a number of problems. Um, one being that it can lead to respiratory issues and the other, um, these kids aren't, or adults or individuals aren't able to clear away bacteria or infections as we might be able to. Um, and that's primarily because that thick mucus doesn't allow the little structures in the mucus that clear away um, things that are bad for us like bacteria. Other organs included, or one of the other predominant organs, organs is the pancreas. Um, so the pancreas is a huge digestive organ that secretes a number of enzymes that help us break down our nutrients and allow us to digest what we eat. If that mucus is thick, it can block the secretion of certain enzymes that allow us to break down that food and can lead if not treated to things like malnutrition or growth issues um, for these these individuals. There are another no, number of other organs involved like sinuses. These kids or adults can develop sinusitis. Um, so anything that ends in itis just means inflammation. So they can have inflammation of the sinuses which can lead to headaches or other issues. Um, they often have saltier sweat um, and I'll get to that in a little bit here. And then there can be issues with um, reproduction. The one thing to note that cystic fibrosis does not affect intelligence. Um, and many of these kids go on to do what other babies do or what other children do. They go to school, play sports, go to college and pursue successful careers and can live you know, into their 30s, 40s, and hopefully much later than that with some advances in treatment. So here's just some uh, standard definition about cystic fibrosis. Um, so again, the two major organs we think about, but aren't the only, are the lungs and the NGI system or digestive system. Um, it's the most common inherited disorder in Caucasians, but can affect all ethnicities. And it's caused by an abnormal protein that doesn't allow um, essentially salt to pass in and out of the cells in a normal manner. And that can lead to that thickened mucus that lines the lungs and pancreas and other organs. Um, common symptoms include things like um, coughing or infections such as pneumonia or bronchitis, um, shortness of breath, issues with growth, again, if not treated, um, can be more severe, frequent bowel movements or abnormalities of their stool, polyps in the nose, sinus infections, and then again, often for men, they, there can be issues with fertility. So it wasn't until 1989 that um, the gene for cystic fibrosis was discovered by Francis Collins. Um, so here's the cover of Science Magazine. This was kind of a huge landmark day in the world of cystic fibrosis. And there's a little boy that has the condition. And then 20 years later, um, a picture of that same, now, no longer boy, but adult um, that has cystic fibrosis. So I thought that was kind of cool. You know, on one hand, getting this, having this gene discovery was, was awesome. You know, there was a lot of hopes and aspirations for treatment and advancements in, in CF. Um, but on the other hand, I think that 
some of these things didn't come to fruition. I think a lot of people had the hopes and dreams that, you know, now we have the gene, let's fix it, let's cure it. And that, that didn't happen. Um, not to belittle the advancements that have been made, because there certainly have been a lot, um, but there's certainly room to grow. So a little bit about this gene for cystic fibrosis. It's located on chromosome seven. Um, and to flash you back to kind of your high school biology class, um, we know if we zoomed inside any cell in our body, we would see that we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes that dictate how we grow, develop, um, what, we, what conditions we may or may not have and so forth. We get one copy of every chromosome from dad and the other from mom. So every child has two copies of the cystic fibrosis gene, as you can see pointed to on that arrow there. If we were to zoom in on that chromosome seven, we would see these tiny little cystic fibrosis genes, one from each parent. Going back to the beginning, they knew this was recessive. So that what this condition or the, how this condition is inherited is it's called autosomal recessive inheritance, meaning that it's due to the combination of both mom and dad's genes. Um, so children with cystic fibrosis inherit that um, from their parents. So we all have two cystic fibrosis genes. If one works and one doesn't, that means you're what we call a carrier for cystic fibrosis. When both parents are carriers for cystic fibrosis and both pass along the cystic fibrosis gene that doesn't work, that's when a child develops the disease. So it's something that happens from the very beginning, from conception, and isn't caused by any uh, external factors. So this is just a, a little diagram on that concept, that recessive inheritance. You can see both depictions of mom and dad up there. They both have one, what's denoted as a mutation or non-working cystic fibrosis gene, which is the darker color, and one normal or functional cystic fibrosis gene. So each of these parents on the top doesn't have any health problems and is not expected to have cystic fibrosis. Um, but what gene they pass on, the working or non-working one, is a flip of a coin. Um, so if they just so happen to both pass along that non-working gene, you'll end up with what we see on the, on the left here, a affected child or a child with cystic fibrosis. Um, so in each pregnancy, there's that one in four chance that they would both pass along that non-working gene, a 50% chance that their children would get one working, one non-working, just like a parent, and then a 25% chance to have a child that doesn't have cystic fibrosis and is not a carrier either. So many people think about, um, or cystic fibrosis often can fly under the radar, I think, in that, you know, when you think of a genetic condition, what do you think of? You think of Down syndrome or maybe even sickle cell disease or other things. Um, people don't often think about cystic fibrosis and that may be due to the fact that there are no outward signs and it doesn't in impact intellect. It's a, it's a physical disease, uh, but it's actually rather prevalent. This is the third leading um, genetic condition that affects Lyborn. So you can see Down syndrome followed by a deletion of a certain chromosome and then cystic fibrosis. So this is much more you know, prevalent even than some of the other conditions that we think of like maybe fragile X syndrome or, or other genetic diseases. Um, and that's partly because this is a very commonly carried condition. Likely about one in 25 or greater South Dakotans is a carrier for cystic fibrosis and would likely never know that. Oftentimes what happens is a family has a child with cystic fibrosis and they turn around and say, where did this come from? We don't have anywhere in our family. And that's normal. Um, as with most of these recessive conditions, parents don't know. There's usually not a family history, um, so it often can come as a surprise. Um, so a little bit about the bi biology of how that single genetic change can lead to the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. So this is kind of a, a busy depiction, but to break it down, um, in the bottom left you'll see the cell nucleus and inside that cell is our chromosomes or that little portion highlighted in yellow, which is the cystic fibrosis gene. If there is a, a change in this gene that allows it not to work, um, that leads to a change in how our cells work. So that purple structure up there is, is representing a, a channel in, the, in our cells. So channels allow nutrients and ions to flow in and out of our cells. The channel that cystic fibrosis or that, that gene change affects is a chloride channel. So it allows salt to move in and out of the cell and with salt comes water. So it allows the flow of a number of different things or kind of like a cascade of, of flow. So if that channel doesn't work because that gene doesn't work or that channel is absent, um, what happens is salt or chloride does not flow effectively in and out of the cell. Um, and again, with salt comes water. So if that salt doesn't flow, that can lead to a kind of a tenacious or thick fluid outside out, that lines the outside of the cell. And that thick mucus can lead to the buildup of those bacteria or infections and can um, inhibit the passage of other substances or enzymes such as in the pancreas. So that's kind of the complicated version of it. This is kind of just the 
general cycle of lung disease. So the main issue is, you know, with that thick mucus buildup on the outside of the cells, that can lead to impaired clearance. So not being able to effectively get that bacteria out of that mucus, it gets kind of trapped in there. And that can lead to growth. It's kind of a breeding ground for bacteria, which can lead to inflammation and ultimately tissue damage, such as damage of the lungs. And then that cycle starts over again. Um, so left untreated, oftentimes, you know, there can be building damage to the, to the organs such as the lungs or the pancreas or so forth. So when are most people diagnosed? Uh, most kids with CF are diagnosed very young, um, with that big second bar, zero to one months. Um, and that's partly because of a program that's been adopted by all 50 states called the newborn screen. Um, this is a test that's routinely done about 24 hours of life on babies to screen for a number of genetic conditions. So a lot of kids are picked up that way, not all. There is a, a lag for in diagnosis for some kids. You know, some are diagnosed at one to three months or four to six. Um, these screens are not perfect. Um, and then some are even diagnosed in the prenatal periods, so that very small first blue bar. Um, th these are often parents that maybe have pursued carrier testing to know if they are carriers um, or, or families that maybe have a family history where they have a brother, sister, aunt, of a cousin that has cystic fibrosis. So it's kind of on their radar there, you know, know that they're at increased chance to be a carrier. So a little bit about the newborn screen. So this is that kind of consider baby's first test. This is um, again done about 24 hours after delivery. Um, and is used to look for a number of genetic conditions in South Dakota. It's around 50, maybe a little under. Um, and that's because, you know, more than one in 300 newborns have a condition that could be detectable by this screen, and many of which do not present with ultrasound findings or very obvious features. So this is a good way to pick up children early and um, initiate treatment quite early as well. So just a little bit on newborn screening. So again, it looks for a panel of conditions and this varies from state to state. So you'd have to look up your particular state to know the details of it. But the good thing to know is that all 50 states have cystic fibrosis on their newborn screening program. Um, and most other conditions, just like cystic fibrosis, are recessive in nature, meaning that both parents are carriers and there's a chance, a one in four chance in each and every pregnancy. And then following a positive or abnormal newborn screen, further testing would take place to determine was this test right or wrong. Sometimes this test can pick up babies as abnormal for cystic fibrosis and when they really don't have it. Same with other conditions and then parents are notified and the, um, the state is updated as well. So the, the main goal of newborn screening is really early identification. Um, because we know that the earlier people with cystic fibrosis or many genetic disorders are identified, the better the care, the better the treatment, the better education. And this allows families to be aware of this very early um, so they can kind of, I guess, you know, hit the ground running as much as you can. So the newborn screening protocol for cystic fibrosis specifically involves measuring this um, substance in the blood called immunoreactive trypsinogen. This is something that is secreted by the pancreas when under, under duress or under stress. Um, so often kids with cystic fibrosis will have pancreases that might have some not be working as effectively as they should or an issue with the enzyme um, secretion. So what this does is it measures that level. If it's elevated, then DNA will be screened for some of the common mutations. There are many, many, many mutations that can cause cystic fibrosis. Some are much more common than others. So it tries to kind of weed some of those out. And if we can get a genetic mutation right away or test for the common ones, that's great. But if only one mutation is identified or none at all, they will perform or they often perform what we call consider the gold standard for cystic fibrosis diagnosis, which is the sweat test. It's essentially a test that's used to measure the amount of salt that's secreted in sweat. Um, so people with cystic fibrosis have abnormal sweat glands again, and this doesn't allow um, them to pull in as much sweat back into the cells as we would normally do to kind of preserve that sweat or to keep the, the salt levels or preserve that salt, I guess, pull salt back into the body. So they often have sweaty, much sweatier salts. So what they do is attach um, an electrode that emits an impulse um, and that causes the child to sweat. They collect that sweat and measure it. And if it's above a certain threshold, that's diagnostic. Um, for a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So that's the end of the genetics piece. I'm gonna pass it over to Angie here to kind of um, touch on the personal side of cystic fibrosis. All right, again, my name is Angie. Uh, this is my son, Brooks. Brooks is currently two and a half years old and does have cystic fibrosis. So Brooks' story, uh, this was my third pregnancy. I have two other boys that are 10 and five. So when we uh, got pregnant with Brooks, there was no history of CF in either side of our families. Pregnancy was going smooth. We came in for just our regular 20-week ultrasound. 
And the scan did show an echogenic and dilated bowel. So basically it was bigger than it should be and it was also more bright per se on the ultrasound pictures. After that, uh, we, I went through carrier testing, which was a blood test just to see if I was a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And they did find that I was a carrier for the double delta F508 mutation, which is the most common mutation. And then after that, my husband was tested and also shown that he was a carrier for the same mutation. So at that point, we, um, we knew that our baby had a one in four chance that um, he would have CF. Uh, the only way to know for sure at that point was to do a genetic amniocentesis. And at that point, we, it was just our choice. We decided to decline it at that point. Um, the rest of the pregnancy went smoothly. I was followed quite quite carefully by uh, the maternal fetal medicine physicians here and he was born October 13th of 16 38 weeks he stayed with us actually in the in the unit for about a half hour and then unfortunately he did um, have to go up to the NICU and the NICU stay actually wasn't due to anything CF related initially it was more just delivery and um, a c-section and kind of getting those lungs to work but then after we got to the NICU it was more for digest digestion issue issues he um, really had a problem keeping anything down and was spitting up a lot of like bile so they were watching him for that at seven days old we did receive the news that his newborn screen did come back positive for cystic fibrosis and then that later was confirmed by that sweat test that uh, Rayanne was talking about. So in the NICU, uh, when he was having problems with his um, digesting and that bile that he kept spitting up, they did a lot of testing and it looked like his bowels, he did not have a meconium ileus, which is like a true blockage in the bowel, but he was just really full of very thick, thick meconium, which again, part of cystic fibrosis is every fluid, every mucus, in the body is gonna be more thick and hard to pass through than someone without CF. So they did a barium enema study, and after that, that was all he needed, and he was able to start digesting and the spitting up stopped. So after nine days, we got to go home. Just a couple days old, he did start on pancreatic enzymes, and these are pills that they actually brought in um, some applesauce into the NICU. And I told them they had the wrong room because my baby is only a couple days old and there's no way he can eat applesauce. Um, and they said, no, it's for him. So basically what happens is with CF, the pancreas is not able to release those enzymes needed for absorption and digestion. And so these enzymes, if he takes them prior to eating, can help with that digesting. Many children with CF have problems gaining weight due to this deficiency. Um, he has a great appetite and he's always shown a nice increase in his BMI and growth measurement charts, so we're very fortunate that way. The enzymes do need to be adjusted based on his age, growth, or uh, we have to watch for any signs of malabsorption, which would be more so changes in his stool if he's not going, if he's going a lot, if it's mucusy or um, oily, th that kind of thing. So we watch that quite carefully. He also is on Prilosec, which helps with reflux and digestion. And this is thought that um, it kind of has a synergistic effect with the enzymes. So it kind of, they work off each other and makes them work a little bit better. He also takes additional salt in his diet. Um, as Rianne said, those with CF have a higher than normal salt concentration in their sweat, so this is needed to replace the salt that is lost. When he was just a baby, we actually measured out the salt and put it in with his um, milk and food. But now that he's a little bit older, most of our diets here in this area of the country have enough salt in them. So we're not quite as specific as to measure it out. And then he also takes um, extra vitamins, A, D, E, and K. These are the fat soluble vitamins. And so again, with that absorption issue, he might not be able to absorb the amounts he needs. So that's where we need to supplement with that. So we first had, after we kind of got down the enzymes and the oral medications, then um, they kind of steered us and helped us into the way of the airway clearance techniques and other nebulized medications. So this little vest is his first vest. He uh, got that at nine months old. Prior to that, he um, we had to use these little, they're almost little pounders, and we kind of you know, beat his chest four, top, or four places in the front and four in the back of his back. 
and we did that for 20 minutes twice a day just to try to break up any of that mucus that may be getting thick and then thankfully when he was about nine months old he was um, big enough they go by chest circumference to get the vest which made it so much easier it was getting hard to chase around a nine month old trying to make him sit for 20 minutes and um, do the percussors so now he does this 30 minutes twice a day and he actually handles it very well the the second picture there is him in his vest that's he's currently in and they'll just keep getting bigger as he gets bigger. During this time of the vest, we also nebulize medications. So he gets albuterol twice a day. This helps to open the airway. And then palmazime is a medication he gets just at night. And that helps to thin any of the mucus that's getting thick so that it's easier hopefully for him to get that off or to get that out, cough it up if needed and to stay away from any bacterial or viral infections. It's not really an option. It's something we do every day, twice a day, to make sure that he can stay as healthy as possible. One of the big new advancements um, with CF patients is this drug called Orkambi. B. This was a previously approved um, for 12 years and older. And then just recently, last August, it was approved for age two and older. He turned two in October and um, started the medication very shortly after his second birthday. And this medication is specifically for people with his mutation. So there's probably over 1,800 different mutations for cystic fibrosis. And again, my husband and I both had the, the exact, the one, the Delta F508, which is the more common one. And this medication is targeted at the people with those specific mutations. So. Uh, the Orcambi is meant to slow down any damage caused by CF by helping that gene maintain the balance between the salt and the water, that defective gene. And the hope is that we'll uh, minimize the clogging of the ducts and organs and hopefully minif minimize the amount of infections or hospitalizations that he will have to go through. He thankfully has not been hospitalized since he left the NICU, so we are very thankful for that. This is just a picture of one day of what he takes for medications. Uh, again, the vitamins and the nebulized medications, the enzymes are all those little white ones that you can see laying there. Again, it's kind of a routine now. It's something we do. He, he calls his vest his stuff, um, wants to do his stuff or doesn't want to do his stuff. But yeah, it's, it's uh, definitely a routine. And once he kind of got it down, it's, it's going quite well. Um, as far as our care team that we go see here, uh, we do see the Sanford um, Children's Specialty Pulmonology is kind of our main one. They're the only CF credited center in South Dakota. So we're very fortunate that we're here. Um, he sees the pulmonologist, a dietitian, a pharmacist that is specialized in cystic fibrosis. A respiratory therapist and then he does have to follow with a pediatric ophthalmologist which was something he had to do prior to him starting that new medication or can be and then he'll have to follow up with him at least yearly the rest of the the care team we do see about every three months again since starting or can be he does need to get blood draws every three months to make sure that the liver is not being affected Obviously, with all good medications, there are some side effects, and that can be one of them. He also gets chest x-rays yearly or as needed if he is sick. And then um, there's a whole gamut of labs that he gets drawn once a year also. He loves going to the castle, so we hope that continues as well. So that kind of wraps up, um, I guess, the life in a day of Brooks and how CF has affected our lives. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is huge with the amount of research they do. The new medications that he recently has started would not have been possible without the foundation. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things we can't do. We can't change our genes. We can't change that he has this. But one thing that we can do is really support the foundation. We're very involved in a lot of the fundraising events that the foundation does, um, including the Great Strides Walk that's coming this summer and then also some other events through the year. Without them, like I said, we wouldn't have the great medications and treatments and it's only supposed to be increasing. At this point, life expectancy of a baby born with CF today is mid 40s. And um, with all the treatments and good things on the horizon, they're hoping to see that number increase quite a bit. So that concludes our presentation for today. So thanks for sticking with us. If you have any questions, feel free to visit the Sanford Imaginetics page.